Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for being here today, uh, for joining me for a review of the 2021-2022 uh, uh, Educator Supply and Demand Report. Um, this report just came out uh, last week. Um, so I appreciate your interest and uh, look forward to sharing some highlights with you and uh, uh, fielding any questions or comments you might have to share with me or, or the group here today. So the first thing I want to do is just real quickly, uh, for those uh, who might not be familiar, and uh, this session is being recorded uh, as well, uh, AAE uh, is an organization, um, a nonprofit professional association uh, with a focus on pre-K through 12 uh, educator preparation, recruitment, and retention. Uh, in addition to the educator supply and demand survey uh, and report, uh, we have many resources uh, most notably the Job Search Handbook for Educators. Uh, we also do webinars and, and blog posts. Uh, we have teacher scholarships. We offer pipeline mini grants for teachers, uh, or actually for school systems uh, to generate the feed the teacher pipeline. Uh, we've got a, an annual conference. We'll be in Baltimore in October. Uh, we host teacher job fairs, both in person and virtual. Uh, we have a national working group on teacher retention, uh, which is a collaboration collaborative effort with Upbeat. And lastly, um, not leastly, we do a job board with KDP, Kappa Delta Pi, called careersforeducators.com. And our members include universities, school systems, other organizations affiliated with teacher preparation, recruitment, and retention, uh, as well as individual professionals, retired institutional representatives, and educator candidates themselves. So we conducted this survey um, between September and March. So it was about a six month, it looks like almost exactly six months uh, that we collected results. Um, we put out calls uh, to both members and non-member organizations to participate. Uh, we did survey both school systems and colleges and universities. Um, and those surveys are not exactly the same, which is intentional, uh, but we do, you know, the hope is that uh, we can, and, and what we've been doing this survey now for 40 years that we have can, can, can bring to the market, um, bring to the field some interesting uh, comparables and, and where there's alignment and where there's misalignment or, mis or disagreement. Um, all respondents uh, receive free digital access to the report. Uh, we do uh, have uh, printed uh, copies available for sale as well uh, with members getting a better price on that. Uh, this year we had 536 respondents, uh, 163 colleges and universities, and 373 school districts. Uh, so there is a margin of error, uh, probably will always be a margin of error, right? But uh, we do, using a 90% confidence level, we have a 6.4% margin of error with colleges and university responses and 4.2% margin of error with school districts. Uh, so today I'm going to review with you uh, uh, got quite a few uh, slides and pieces of information to share with you, but uh, just to give you kind of a table of contents, if you will, going to share with you the the national composite score um, and then show you how that compares to to the 40 years of history of this report of this survey. Uh, show you talk to you about the level of agreement between institutional types, again colleges and universities uh, and school systems. Uh, review areas of shortage and surplus talk about alignment between educator supply, um, specifically preparation and the demand for educators in different areas, uh, educator preparation trends, hiring trends and challenges, and then uh, uh, respondent suggestions for uh, ways that we might attract future educators into the field. So I'm gonna start out with a big, big number, literally and figuratively, uh, both um, 3.89, so, um, for those who aren't uh, as familiar with this uh, survey, uh, we do it. We use a five-point scale, where 1.0 um, is a is, it represents considerable surplus. Uh, 2.0 represents some surplus. 3.0 is balanced, right in the middle. Uh, everything's you know as it should be. Uh, 4.0 is some shortage, and 5.0 is uh, or five points up double zero is a uh, considerable shortage. And so 
this is an, on a national level, 3.89. Uh, obviously, uh, not where we want to uh, be, but that is the reality, um, and uh, it's significant. Uh, this is uh, a longitudinal chart that maps back to the beginning of, of this survey back in 1981. Um, this is the highest score, uh, composite score, we've seen in the history of this report. Um, I, I imagine that uh, there's not uh, a lot of surprised faces uh, in, the, in the group here. Uh, the last time we had a balanced composite score, so something between, um, well, I'm trying to remember what exactly the, the figure is, but it's approximately, you know, again, around three. So it's, you know, 2.8 to 3.2 or that, that general area. Um, uh, yeah. Drew, Drew, Drew's asking in the chat, uh, remind me again what the composite score is measuring. So it's measuring um, the, the level of shortage. So, and I'll get, get into more, more information, but as, as these surveys go out and the results are collected, what, what we're asking is on a scale of one to five, uh, where would you, what would you say is the level of, uh, of, of, of shortage or surplus uh, for each of these 64 different subject areas that we study, uh, on, and again, on a five-point scale. And then we take all those results um, for all of the subject areas and, and mass them into one and across all of the respondents, both colleges and universities and school systems, and create this composite score uh, to tell us on the whole where people think, think we are. So on the whole, uh, again, we're, we're definitely headed, heading in the wrong direction. So uh, as I said at the top, we are we're very interested and in, in really one of the uh, one of the unique uh, components of AAAE as an association is that we have members um, from from both sides of the equation, if you will, the the folks that are involved with preparing uh, future educators and the folks who are hiring educators into the field, and so this and this survey is is a perfect example of that. So we. Uh, we collect the data, like I said, it's, it's, they're slightly different surveys and we collect the information from both sides. And so we always look at in this report, what's the level of agreement um, between, those, between those two types of organizations. So uh, as you can see here, this is a, a snapshot of an, of an item that appears in the report itself, uh, listing those, those five different levels from considerable shortage down to considerable surplus, uh, or maybe we could say up to considerable surplus. Um, and, and so it's colleges and it's districts, and then it's the level of agreement. And, and the level of agreement, I mean, it, we're literally talking about, you know, there's 64 areas. So, for example, the colleges are saying of those 64 subject areas, 17 of those are in considerable shortage, and the districts are saying 29. But the reason that final number is, is 15 and not 17 is there is not complete agreement on what those areas of considerable shortage are. Um, and I'll dig into some of that uh, during this time, uh, but certainly all of that information is contained in the, in the full report. Uh, this, this is a representation, as a reminder, this is representation on this uh, screen right now of national numbers. Uh, and also this is this level of overall agreement, uh, 63% uh, is very similar to last year when it was about 59%. Uh, I think in the, in the four years that I've been executive director, I don't, I want to say we had a 75% uh, one year, but that's that was definitely the highest uh, that I can recall seeing. So there's always always a bit of a, of a dis disagreement, which is interesting and worth exploring. Um, subject area shortage counts. So uh, this does include both considerable and some shortage some shortage areas. Um, and, and we're going to talk about alignment, uh, the level of alignment between um, between the institutions in, in a little while in a few slides here. But uh, for now, I um, want to talk about the fact that colleges and universities uh, in of 64 different subject areas that we study, they, they believe that 52 of them have shortages. Uh, so that's, of course, pretty significant. Uh, and that is an increase from last year when it was when they, it came up to be 45. Uh, districts uh, feel even more concerned about it, uh, showing uh, indicating 60 out of 64 uh, uh, subject areas are in some level of shortage, either some or considerable. 
uh, and I will be talking more about, uh, particularly about those considerable shortage areas uh, shortly here. And then uh, again, across both institution types, uh, 37 uh, with, with some level of, with that level of agreement uh, that was referenced in the previous slide. So all those things uh, are trending uh, up uh, pretty significantly. Uh, in the area, in the considerable shortage areas, um, this I found this interesting that uh, last year colleges and universities reported 18 subject areas that we, they considered in considerable shortage. Uh, this year, that number actually dropped down to 17. Um, so uh, that's that's an interesting takeaway. Uh, the districts, however, said that went from 17 to 29. Um, so that's that's not quite double, but it's pretty darn close. Uh, there was agreement on bilingual, multicultural ed, uh, chemistry, uh, general math and science, uh, which would be the middle school level, uh, math, physics, and special education. And we do study 10 different areas of special education, and all 10 of those areas um, are in considerable shortage, and both colleges, universities, and school systems, school districts agree. Uh, on that fact, uh, and unfortunately, that's been pretty consistent uh, in recent years. Uh, there, there, as far as looking at at those scores, those overall scores between school districts and colleges and universities, the most di disagreement, the most distance uh, between scores, uh, is on four languages: uh, Arabic, classical, uh, that's Greek and Latin, and then Japanese and Russian. Um, so interesting. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure what what quite to make of it, but uh, just reporting at this at that with that uh, piece of information, I guess I'm just uh, reporting reporting what was what we what we got back, uh, and uh, we can all surmise and and maybe explore what where that uh, why that disagreement. So considerable shortage areas in three or more regions. So we all we do break the country up into ten different regions. Um, Nine of those regions are in the continental US. Um, the West region does include Hawaii, uh, FYI, and we do um, have Alaska is its own region. Um, so when you look at across the country uh, at all the different regions, um, what I'm sharing with you here on this slide is what are the subject areas where at least three um, regions are reporting considerable shortages. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to read them to you, but you, you see kind of the usual suspects here, uh, STEM fields and uh, uh, lots of, you know, again, all the, all the areas of special ed, quite a few of the areas of uh, related services, uh, nursing, social work, psychology. Maybe, maybe a couple of surprises in there. I'm kind of a bit surprised myself to see family and consumer science, but there it is. So then kind of look, looking at it from a, a, a twisting it a little bit and looking at it from a standpoint of uh, where, you know, which, which on a regional basis, uh, how many of the 64 subject areas, how many um, subject areas in that region are being reported as considerable shortage. The largest counts came from Rocky Mountain region um, and from the West region. Uh, so you can see those in the dark red. Uh, the then then 34 um, subject areas were reported as considerable shortage out of the Great Plains Midwest states. Middle Atlantic had 32, Southeast had 27, Alaska and the Great Lakes um, those those regions reported 26, South Central 21, uh, South Northwest 16, and the Northeast just five. And as, as I'm as I put on my slide there, certainly uh, curious if anybody's surprised um, by those results. But 39 areas um, have have seen shortages uh, of some form or fashion. Again, some or some shortage or considerable shortage for at least seven years. Um, so these are the uh, the repeat offenders, if you will. Um, and, and again, it's 39 areas out of 64 uh, that have been appearing on the on the this list for 
for at least seven years. Um, and that information is is also highlighted in the, I mean, it's it's included in the in the full report as well. Um, but again, a lot of the usual suspects, uh, maybe a few not so usual suspects. You see a lot of languages in addition to STEM and special education and related services, but you also see library science media tech and family and consumer science and agriculture education. Um, so maybe I shouldn't have been surprised about uh, facts, family and consumer science, because it's been there for seven years. Uh, subject areas with surplus. We had zero for 21 and 22. Um, first time uh, in recent memory that we had absolutely zero. Uh, last year, we had just one social studies education. Uh, and that was identified by as a surplus area by school districts. If memory serves, uh, there were colleges, universities did not identify any um, surplus areas. On a regional basis, uh, there were two subject areas this year uh, that were identified as surplus: PE in Alaska and French uh, language in the Northeast. Uh, last year, we had uh, six different areas. Uh, some of them across multiple regions, uh, health ed, uh, intermediate ed, kindergarten, primary ed, Japanese, PE, and social studies. So I wanna talk now about the level of alignment um, between educator supply, uh, again, that, that being preparation and then demand. So these are areas where there are, our, our studies shows that there is alignment um, so the, the demand for uh, biology, chemistry, e uh, English, uh, kindergarten and math, uh, kindergarten and primary ed and math are, the, the demand is high, but the percent of institutions offering those programs is also high. So, you know, it's it certainly, um, it's certainly the fact that, you know, we still, we know that there are, there are you know, shortages in those areas, but as far as alignment and capacity, um, you know, the universities are showing that they, you know, they are prepared uh, to meet that demand and there is alignment there. Uh, and then there's medium demand matched with medium percent of institutions offering in the areas of health ed, music ed, PE, and theater drama education. Uh, I included there the, the three uh, that fell off the list since last year. Uh, so last year, we also had art, visual ed, elementary school administrator, and German uh, as far as having a, a, an alignment uh, in the, in the, between demand, between medium demand and medium percent of institutions offering. So now that we've talked about the, um, the level of, or where there's alignment, let's talk about where there's a significant lack of alignment. Um, and there, there are a lot of, you know, the, the, the subject areas you didn't see on the previous slide and you don't see on this slide, uh, there is, there is um, some level of, of misalignment, some lack of alignment. Uh, but I've decided uh, in the interest of time to just focus on where there's alignment and then where, is, where we're really far out of alignment. So there are 25 subject areas here. Um, this, in, this number uh, increased um, from 21 last year. Um, actually a few subject areas uh, fell off the list. In other words, they moved uh, out of far uh, misalignment into more that some, some misalignment category, uh, that being uh, Russian language, classical, physical therapy, gifted and talented. Um, so this list actually includes eight new, new ones uh, for this year, uh, and those are highlighted in orange. Um, and I also want to highlight that there is just one area uh, where the uh, there is misalignment, but it's the other other direction. Uh, we have social studies education that has a higher percent of institutions offering it than needed to meet the demand, based on on our the results of our survey. So. Let's talk uh, about the trends for traditional programs uh, in responding colleges and universities. So um, you'll see from the bar chart here that uh, what we're doing is comparing uh, last year to this year. 
um, traditional preparation uh, dropped from about um, 84% to 79%. Um, and uh, the, the uh, uh, sorry, uh, it, we went from 84% down to 79% from, from the non-traditional prep, um, went from 12 to 15%. Uh, and then it also, and I apologize, I'm realizing, I think I put a confusing headline on this. So this is, <laughs> This is, uh, now I'm really, really got myself tied in a knot here. Um, what did I, I apologize. Let, let me, uh, let me just come, come try to come back to that at the, at the end and, and clarify. Um, this next, this next chart, this pie chart shows, uh, what portion of school district hires, uh, were traditionally pr prepared versus non-traditionally prepared. Uh, or emergency hires, um, you see, uh, and, I, and I didn't, I know I didn't put the numbers on there, the traditional prep, um, and, and maybe that's what I was trying to reference in the previous slide, but it went from 84% uh, in 2021 to uh, 12, uh, to, excuse me, to 79% uh, in 2122. Uh, and, and I will tell you, and this is highlighted in the full report, that uh, it's a little bit more for suburban uh, as far as tr uh, traditional prep uh, of hires, uh, less for urban and the rural rural uh, districts are near the average. Uh, Non-traditional went from 12% to 15%. Uh, so we're seeing a larger portion of hires coming from non-traditional prep backgrounds, uh, more for urban, less for suburban, and again, rural uh, near the average. And then emergency hires went from 4% to 6% overall. So um, we're obviously seeing, you know, probably continuing to see some shift in terms of, of the portion of school, school district hires uh, with non-traditional um, or emergency hire uh, situation as opposed to traditional background, traditional prep. And the number one reason given for hiring teachers without traditional prep is pretty simply lack of traditional candidates who apply. 71% uh, of responding districts um, shared that. So we asked the question to universities, if some of your graduates leave your state for unemployment, what states do they tend to move to? Uh, at least 30 respondents shared that uh, the answer was California, Florida, Illinois, North Carolina, and or Texas. Um, and uh, I've made note here that uh, apologies to our, to our Colorado friends, uh, they were in the top five last year and they are no longer. So district challenges faced, um, we asked three questions about uh, the challenges, level of challenge. Uh, so we asked, you know, do you have, have enough candidates for your open positions? Uh, what level of challenge is that for you? And 98% of respondents said that's uh, some level of challenge, whether it's big, moderate, or small. Uh, so that's a huge number, uh, for hopefully not surprising, but 98% uh, of respondents said it was a challenge. A big challenge, 70, almost 78% uh, said it's a big challenge. Uh, so uh, again, reflecting the, the severity of the, of the current situation. Uh, as far as recruiting teachers of color, uh, nearly 90% reported that that was uh, a, a challenge for them. Uh, but I was a bit surprised to see it's, it's only about 62% uh, said it was a big challenge. Uh, and then you got moderate and small challenge uh, coming in behind there. And then lastly, decreases in the funding your district receives. This is a, viewed as a challenge for 88% of districts, but only 33 or so percent uh, of them consider this a, a big challenge. Maybe the uh, ARP funds uh, have helped out with that. And then last, but certainly not, uh, not least importantly, uh, I wanted to highlight uh, the best way to attract future educators or, you know, specifically high school students uh, to study education in college. Um, the, and, and what I did here was, uh, so again, we asked the question of, you know, we collected the information for both school districts and for colleges and universities. Uh, and so 
um, I've given you the the top uh, ended up with the top six answers, uh, or I, th I think what I did was the top four answers uh, on the school districts, and then I and then I added in you know how those colleges and universities compare on those, and then the last couple are you know uh, trying to it's a, it's a blend of trying to recognize you know uh, college and universities highlighted promote promote prestige or profession or marketing teaching as a career. And so I wanted to share with you how those compare uh, between college universities and, and school districts. But the clearly the top answer uh, for both uh, institutional types is compensation or financial incentives, uh, but also um, the, the, the number two and not too far behind is, is high school to college teacher programs. Um, but you see some other, some other ideas here as well. Um, so take those, take those ideas and, and run with them. So open welcoming uh, questions, comments. Uh, I know I see there's a couple of things waiting for me in the chat. Um, yeah, so Drew's asking, um, yeah, I would think that physics would be one of these subject areas, high demand, low offering. Um, I can check. I can check on that. Um, actually, got the report uh, waiting here. Uh, and do these include non-institutional uh, higher ed programs? Um, they are. Um, we invite um, edu all educator prep programs to participate. Um, I don't know that we actually have any uh, any any got any respondents um, from those from those groups this year. I guess I was wondering if any of the the district responses, if they said or they broke down the non traditional people they hire, are they coming yeah. from non traditional IHE programs versus non traditional non IHE programs, or yeah. if, if that's too much of a distinction? So. Right. Right. Yeah, we're not we're not currently asking um, for that distinction, but uh, uh, I appreciate the the question, and we certainly we're always looking to, you know, improve our our survey if where where we can, where it makes sense. So I'll take that. Yeah. Under, in under some advice. in some states like Texas, and I think there's a few others, the those online for profit teacher preparation programs have have really grown a lot, and I don't know if anybody on here is. From or more familiar with Texas than I am, but yeah. um, I know that for some states that's a big deal, but other states it's not much of a deal. So, yeah. so uh, to to answer your your other question, so physics is showing as and it as has been actually looking back uh, in our report, we go back to 12, 2012, 2013 for every year uh, since then, and including this year, we've got it showing as medium supply and high demand. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? And you can feel free to drop it in the chat or unmute yourself and, uh, or just other, or again, questions or comments, reactions. Have any of the folks on uh, the webinar today seen that article from the Wall Street Journal? I think it was February 1st or March 1st, about 800,000 teachers leaving the profession over the last 24 months for ed tech. I, I did I did not. I, I don't want to speak it, for everybody. It's um, out there. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll mm -hmm. definitely be looking for that. Mm -hmm. I, I will say I, I've seen um, when I'm when I'm on LinkedIn, I do see a lot of. Uh, I mean, there, there's there's been a, I think a sea change in terms of, um, you know, educators looking to get, you know, pre K through twelve educators looking to get into ed tech, and my perception is that ed tech is also has also opened their eyes arms wide open uh, to that prospect. 
Um, so it's definitely uh, what, given given my you know given that experience or that what I what I've been seeing, I, I can't say I'm the eight hundred thousand. I guess is a shocking number, but um, I'm not surprised that there has been a notable yeah. uh, level of movement mm -hmm. uh, more more so than in the past. Well, thank you very much for for your time today. And uh, like I said, this this uh, um, meeting, this uh, webinar will be uh, has been recorded, and and you will um, get a access to it when it's uh, when it's ready to go, and it's going up on our website. Thanks, Tim. Thank you all. Appreciate you.